Well, hello. How are you this week? I'm fine. I've fully recovered from my little tumble that I had last week. So nice to see you again and welcome if you're new. My name's Penny. I live in the southeast of England with Pete, my husband, and my four chickens. And this week I'm going to talk about my DNA results, uh, a fascinating fact about the cat's whiskers. Oh, what else? Oh, I've got a little film at the end. And because I didn't go out last week, because I was, you know, resting and that, it's just a little bit about the uh, couple of visitors' birds uh, in our garden. And also, uh, we go, as you know, we go to the Isles of Scilly um, for our holidays. And last, when I was last there, I just took a couple of photos. I didn't have my lovely camera then, but I just took a lovely couple of lovely photos of the red squirrels there and they were introduced some years ago so I put that at the beginning. I'm going to read one of Pete's stories about his Auntie Rose and what else am I going to do? Oh I'm going to do some transactional analysis which is a form of counselling that is very helpful. It started in episode 12 and so I'm going to carry on a bit more with that. And just have a little chat at the beginning. So welcome. I want to, uh, i just get my bits here. Bits I'm going to show you. Oh yes, this is Kirsty. Kirsty. And I'll tell you about her in a minute. She's sitting there. And this, I've got my book. I've got a few notes written down. Uh, because washing machine head, I realised why I had washing machine head last week. And and it's because I was going to talk about DNA and it's too difficult. I've written it all out, I've thought about it, I've been saying this, that and t'other and I can't do it. Because you start off with mum and dad. Okay, here I'll put their photo. Mum and dad, wedding. Alright, then I go back. I've got her mum and dad, fair dues. We're all the same. We're all in the same boat. Her mum and dad, yeah. I have. Mum said they never talked about their wedding day. They, well, they haven't got a photo. She's never seen a photo of it. We'd love to. I don't know if another member in the family have got have got one, but mum hasn't. But then mum was the baby of the family, so maybe she didn't get the many photos. You know. Anyway, so they got, got married, I think it was um, 1905, February the 1st. Yeah, so there's a picture of them. Then my other nan and granddad, my dad's mum and dad, Ethel and Edmund, here's a picture of their wedding. And don't you just love the policeman? He's got all his medals on and he's got a truncheon. What's that all about? Does anybody know? But uh, yeah, so there's my... Now... When I start washing machine head, I go down my nan, her line, but then it's not just one person, it's two persons. And then for every two, it becomes another, oh, it's massive. But then you go down her dad's line, then it's another massive. And then, of course, you go down my granddad's line. So you see where I'm coming from. Where do you start? That's where my head starts going into a spin. But what's really important, I think, is I've followed my nan's line um, back six generations, six great grandmas and great granddads and they came from Bungie and Beckles which is where darling Jan, you know my friend who I gave the bag to, oh Pete's on the phone, she yeah, she loves the bag anyway. So they come from, from Suffolk, then they come down the line and then um, we've got three Hannahs, a Daniel, a James, a Joseph and um, they all had, you know, quite a lot of children as was the way then. But uh, I read in history how uh, they said to the people in the countryside, come to London, you know, come to a city and so that's where they came to London. Then my uh, granddad's uh, line, uh, upholsterers, watchmakers, jewellers, uh, my granddad was a farrier, 
and they are from London. No two ways about it. They've been there for generations. I go back six to great granddads and uh, that's where they're from. However, my great grandma, who is my granddad's nan, I mean, let's face it, it's not very far back, is it? Two brothers, my, you know, my, my, my great granddad, my granddad's father, him and his brother, they both married two Scottish ladies, sisters, uh, who came from Aberdeen. And I now am as equal Scottish as I am English because of them, Charlotte Milne. She was my great grandmother. And honestly, I could tell you so much about them. I've looked it all up. They died in Helmet Row, which was a place, it's a listed building now. And uh, it housed rope makers and watchmakers and jewelers. And yeah, that's, you know, I can trace them back to there, which is lovely, right in the centre of London, you know, King's Crossway. But also the fact that they married these two sisters. And when you look at the the um, census, they all lived together. You know, these two brothers and the two Scottish sisters they all lived together in this tiny house. How many children? How many children? And then my granddad in uh, 1911, he's one of nine children living in five rooms with his mum and dad. And uh, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Sedgwick Street. And I remember talking to my dad about Sedgwick Street. Oh, it, it didn't bring back good memories for him. So and Myrtle Street. There are all these little streets uh, with so many children in them. But of course, when you see pictures of photographs of the children, then they were all in the street, weren't they? And they all started working so young. So life was very different. But the important thing for me is that Charlotte Milne was my great nan. And so I'm as much Scottish as I am English, which is fantastic. So I've been learning some Doric yeah, that's the dialect of Aberdeen. So, uh, yeah, it's not easy, I can tell you. I act fit like, but the trouble is, Pete's just had his DNA back, and I'll talk about that next time. And he is three quarters Yorkshire. Now, you see, does that come from the granddad that nobody knows anything about? We don't know. On the other hand, his mum's family... Uh, all come from her dad and all his family right right back come from Cheshire so would they class that as Yorkshire we don't know we've got to do a bit more looking into it but of course it's been the joke of the family now flat caps and whippets but I do feel that I talk this with a Yorkshire accent instead of a Doric Scottish accent because a Doric Scottish person would say aye hey, I fit fine no, I I fit like, and that means hello, how are you? I I fit like. Sit down and take the wet off your feet. Well, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? Chugnies, they're chickens. Foos your do's, foos your do's, I like that one. How are you? It literally means how's your pigeons, but um, the response to that is when someone up in Aberdeen uh Machai, that's where I come from, where they, when they say foos your do's, um, how are you? You, you respond by saying, ah, oh, pecking around. No, pecking away. Ah, oh, pecking away. Yeah, how are you, pigeons? Pecking good. Ah, oh, pecking away. So, foos your do's. So, yeah, quite a lot to learn, and it's good fun. And I did see when I was Googling it, that there's a Scottish MP who's insisted in being able to speak her, her dialect of Doric while she's being sworn in. Why not? It's her dialect. So that's my dialect too. So what's next? I'm going to show you what I've been making this week. But before I show you what I've been making, I'll show you what I have made. And this is what I have made. It's cashmere, so it's jolly warm. And do you know what? I'm thinking of putting it on because the heating's gone off and it's getting a bit chilly in here. And my friend, I'm not a crocheter because it hurts my wrist. And um, But my friend taught me how to do this. So you make quite a lot of these. 
I'll put up here the book it comes from. So if you're interested, or let's get my head in. Um, so this is what you make. You make a lot of those. It's been screwed up in the drawer. I mean, you can press them all out. You start off, it's not difficult, you see. It's a little round, and then a little chains round there. Then, of course, you have to make these petals, and then you make another layer of petals. So it's a double layer petal. And because the wool is so fine, it is fingering weight, not four ply. It's very, very fine. A fingering weight cashmere. And then you join them all together with those little loops. And that's what it makes. It goes down to a point. One, three... One, two, three. This is like the DN this is like the DNA. Four, and then it doubles up, doubles up so quickly, and you get that. But it's jolly warm because it's cashmere, and you could do it in anything, couldn't you? But I saw this. Uh, I realize after making this, this is one of my first shawls I ever made. Oh, it is warm though. But I realise that I'm not keen on the holes. I quite I mean, it's lovely if you're going to a wedding or something like that, isn't it? But I quite like something a bit more, you know, of course, cowls and all of that that are in now. Um, I like those. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't go through quite so much. And here's Thomas Quilt. This is what I've been doing. So I showed you last time how I was sewing the top together. And then you get the backing. You put that face down on the floor like that then you put your wadding down on top of it and then you put your top layer down on top of that and you make a sandwich and then literally you just sew through can I can you see my stitches there they are I don't do teeny weeny stitches I just hold them together can you see them there hold it together I use a nice um, thick embroidery it, it's like you could use embroidery thread but you know the one I like it's um, oh what's it called my brain uh, hang on I'll get it this is what I have to do so of course it's orophil isn't it and that's what I use uh, and I, I really love that it's beautiful for hand quilting and then I found the book Rowan Lace and, and it's got that on the front. I think she shows it better than I do. That's a beautiful book uh, with lots of different patterns in, but it's not even fingering. See, for w, it's, it, it's very, very fine, but it's rather beautiful. Um, they've got blankets in it and, and goodness knows what. There it is. Ah, oh, so that took my fancy. So I made that some, some years ago. So this is the quilt. Shall I stand up and show you? I'll show you what I've done. Oops. I'm not very good at this. So that's the front. I've almost finished. I've just got to quilt. I've done it what they call in the ditch. So along each seam I've I've quilted. So you can't see the quilting. I might do a little line going down there. But on the other hand, I think it speaks for itself. So I'm just going to go down each ditch and stitch in the ditch. And that's the back. and then when I've done finished that next week I'll show you and I'll show you how to do the binding so that will just show you the process of making a quilt obviously the bigger the quilt the harder it is so there we go so what's next I think I've jawed enough don't you 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for having your cup of tea with me or whatever it is you like to drink. So I'm going to now go straight into the fascinating fact. And so I'll see you the other side of that. Cat's whiskers. They're akin to a human sense of smell or vision. And that's why a cat's whiskers should never be cut. A cat's whiskers are so sensitive, in fact, that if it's required to use a narrow food or water bowl, the pressure to its tactile hairs can cause what is known as whisker stress. This kind of fatigue is often a result of the cat's whiskers bumping up against the sides of its dish. If your cat is scooping out food with its paw or knocking food on the floor to eat, consider getting a wider bowl. Each whisker is connected to a muscle sling, which allows the cat to move them independently. Likewise, large muscles surrounding the whiskers are used to move them all as one. The cat may fan out or direct its whiskers forward when hunting or yawning. They can be pulled back against a cat's cheeks too. Their whiskers are attached to tissues that have multiple nerve endings. These nerves are sensitive to even the slightest movement of air. As a result, cats can detect nearby objects without seeing them, obviously an advantage in the dark. Also called vibrissae or tactile hairs, whiskers are two to three times thicker than regular cat hair and have roots three times deeper. Those found on either side of the muzzle are called my stasial whiskers, but they also have them on their jaws, above their eyes, near their ears, and on the back of their forelegs, all places a cat would need to gather information about its surroundings, including in the wild, its prey. Since whiskers are sensitive to pressure, cats use them to determine the position and movement of an object or of prey. Whiskers can also help cats to measure the width of an opening before they attempt to go through it. The Encyclopaedia Britannica acknowledges that the functions of the whiskers are only partially understood. However, it is known that if they're cut off, the cat is temporarily incapacitated. Research has shown that cats without whiskers have trouble in estimating the size of openings and can easily get stuck. And because whiskers are important to a cat's balance, without them, they have trouble walking straight and have difficulty running. They also tend to get disoriented and fall. Scientists are designing robots equipped with sensors that mimic cat's whiskers to help the robots navigate around obstacles. These sensors, called e-whiskers, should have a wide range of applications for advanced robotics. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? I mean, we all love cats. Never thought that about the the uh, bowl, uh, whether it, if it's too small, you know, they might chuck it out on the floor because it's interfering with their whiskers. And uh, to think that scientists are copying that again to uh, use for for the robots. They get quite a lot, don't they, of inspiration from nature. So I'm going to read you one of Pete's stories now. And this is about his Auntie Rose. Every Saturday, without fail, winter or summer, come rain or shine, Auntie Rose would come to tea. She would arrive at around five o'clock and stay for about four hours before heading home again. Home was 119 Bowes Road, Palmer's Green, a suburb in North London. She lived there with my Uncle Alf and Aunt Ada and had a tiny little room between the dining room and bathroom. I can't remember ever going in, but had fleeting views when her door was open. Auntie Rose was a spinster and had worked for as long as I could remember at the metal box just off the North Circular Road. 
It was there she lost her left thumb in a machine, and as the story is told, calmly walked over to the first aid and asked for a sticking plaster. She had not only lost her thumb, on the other hand, the top of her middle finger was also missing. This had been caused by a piece of wire wool turning it septic. She had never been pretty, and as she got older, her face became the colour of parchment and her eyes watery, making her look like Clement Freud's sister. Her temperament usually matched her looks, but every now and again, especially after a couple or three sweet sherries, you'd catch a glimpse of a good-natured, lively personality that perhaps, if circumstances had been different, would have come to the fore. Her features were not helped by the 20 players' weight she smoked every day, which also seemed to exaggerate her sniff that infuriated my dad. I don't mind her coming, he'd say to Mum, but I wish she'd stop that bally sniffing. She's always sniffed, right from a baby, Mum would reply. She'll never stop. Another feature that had probably not her endeared her to the opposite sex were her legs. Pipe cleaners, my brother Dennis called them. How they got her around was a mystery, but get her around they did. For all her faults, I loved her, and as I grew older, learned how to deal with whatever mood she was in. She'd always come to tea on Saturdays, for as long as I could remember. In fact, from before I was born. My earliest recollections were from when we also lived in Bowes Road, at number 30, a 15-minute walk. In she'd come. Hello, Grace. I'll put the kettle on. Then turning to me, and what have you been up to? I never knew how to answer that question, but it never really mattered, because she never expected one. Once the tea had been made and she'd settled down on a hard back upright dining table chair, never a soft easy chair, she'd reach into her handbag and produce a bag of sweets, which on passing to me she would say, don't eat them all at once, and then back into the handbag, this time producing my comic, Sunny Stories by Enid Blyton, which changed to the eagle when I got older. Then, from a different bag, she would take out her knitting. She, like Mum, was a great knitter. The pair of them would sit chatting away, Aunt Rose's needles clicking, Mum silent, but both producing woolly garments to be worn, when finished, by one of the family. Whenever they got the chance, out would come the knitting. I have a photograph of them sitting waiting for the Isle of Wight ferry, coats on to keep them warm knitting away together. Later, when we moved to Norfolk Avenue, I wondered if she would still come. Although we were still in Palmer's Green, the distance she would have to walk had more than doubled. I had only to wait until the first Saturday to find out. When the familiar cry of, Hello, Grace, I'll put the kettle on, rang out, albeit in different surroundings. When we moved to Potter's Bar, she still came to tea. The journey from Bowes Road to her house then was quite a trek. First she had a 20-minute walk to catch the 29 bus, and then after a 45-minute bus journey, she had another 20-minute walk, this time not on the flat, but up the dreaded Mims Hall Road. She had stopped bringing the sweets and comics, because I was now 18 but she would offer me one of her player's weights, which I would decline unless I was really desperate, offering her a senior service, which she'd always take. At that time, all of my mates would meet round my house before deciding where we would go, and often there would be up to 20 of us all crowded in the back room, vespers, lambrettas, minivans and other vehicles lining the street outside. This was sheer hell for Auntie Rose, trying to watch her favourite programme of the week, Dixon of Doc Green. He's a bit past it, ain't he? A voice would say. Oh, blimey, he's unsteady on the old plates, another would chime in. 
When are you lot going out? She'd say. What, I miss the best comedy on telly? We'd answer and troop out, leaving her in peace. Little beggars, we'd hear her say to Mum. I don't know how you put up with them. Aunt Rose had two great passions, apart from Dixon of Dot Green. The first were her nieces and nephews, whom she would spoil with sweets and comics until they became too old, and the second was photography, or should I say, taking snaps. At every family get-together and holidays, there she would be, with her brownie box camera, clicking away, hand-cupped, shielding the viewfinder from the glare of the sun. Arranging little tableaus of us in the sea, the men with trousers rolled halfway up their legs, knotted handkerchiefs on heads, and the women holding their dresses just above their knees, trying not to show the elasticated ends of their drawers, or passion killers, as Dad would call them. Most of the old photographs I have of aunties, uncles and cousins were all taken by Auntie Rose. After Uncle Alf's death in 1969 and 119 Bowes Road was sold, Aunt Rose rented a little ground floor flat which suited her very well. My Aunt Amy lived in the same road, as did Mrs Polson, our neighbour, who'd looked after me when Mum had cut her wrist. Penny and I were living at St George's Road then, which was only ten minutes or so away by car. We often popped in to see her, and she would come round to look after Kim and Nicola when we wanted to go out. She played cards and dominoes with them, as she had done with the various children for years. Fond memories. Well, my family says she's off again, as you know, so that did promote something. No, no, that invokes something in me, those memories. So I'm going to go and make myself a cup of tea, and then I'm going to come back and do some TA. I'll see you then when I pull myself together. I'm back. I've had something to drink, and uh, I'm fine. I don't know where that came from. I think it was the thought of my two little girls, and mind you, they've got memories about Auntie Rose. I think she used to scare them a bit, you know, having fingers missing <laughs> when you're little. It's quite something, isn't it? But uh, she was a dear. Anyway, who knows where emotions come from, but they came tumbling out, so, yeah. Um, I was going to tell you about Kirsty, wasn't I? So Heather's mum made her for me she lives in Perth and I thank you Dorothy thank you so much she's been doing the Highland Fling and she's absolutely exhausted you can tell yeah and she made me a lovely card and Dorothy is well into her 80s and had a big operation last year and and she's done so well to get over it and now look what she's made me and made me the card so thank you so much. It's so appreciated. And I know you watch this on your big telly. So uh, hello. And hello to Sharon, the, your other daughter. Yeah. I wish I was up there in Bonnie, Scotland with you. So her, Dorothy's maiden name, I think, was actually Milne, which is, what you know, my great-grandmother's name. So... Uh, dearest Penny, this is the baby of the family. I've added the tartan turi. So that's a Turi. A diddly di diddy and bow in honour of your Scottish ancestry. When she was here, she was Kirsty. It's a Scottish name. But now she's yours, you can, of course, give her any name you like. Oh, I wouldn't dream of changing it. She wouldn't know where she is. She's gorgeous. And I hope you like her and get as much fun in having her as I have in having had making her for you. Thank you for all the lovely Thursday mornings. Yeah, because now my mum and her, uh, Heather's mum, Dorothy, uh, we all get together at four and we have a good old chin wag. And uh, every third... Oh, there's a squirrel. I want to get a little film of that to put, to put with my other bits. Sitting away, swinging away. I'll try and get a little film and add that to it. So... Yeah, we see her every Thursday. She's in Scotland, and that's the joy, isn't it, of being in lockdown and having to find ways of uh, communicating and get on with each other. Yeah, so thank you very much for Thursday mornings and for Chinwag. She loves them. So that's really kind of you to say. So that's Kirsty with her... Oh, what was it? 
I want to say sporran. It's not a sporran. What is it? A turi. That's the turi. Beautifully made. So let's get on with TA, shall we? Right. So we're on to transactions. So I think we just started that last week. If I come in and say hello, and you say hello, we've had a transaction. If I say hello to you, what's the time? And you come back with one o'clock, adult to adult. But then I showed you how we can switch. Hello, what's the time? You're late. And you're then in parent, controlling parent. And your whole aim is to push that person into child. Well, it benefits you if they're in child because you can get in parent and start bossing them about and start telling them what's what. And if they've, you've pushed them into child, and they might stay there. And, um, yeah. And then they're always on the back foot, aren't they? And do you know what happens to them so much in life? Especially if they're adapted child. Or as we've said, oh, I'll have to get a little, little film of that later. Oh, there's two of them. Oh, oh chasing round the tree. Seen that one off. I'll try and get that and put it up anyway. So, yes. So we don't want to stay in child, do we? We don't want to live our lives in adapted child or even rebellious child. Because rebellious child feels like they're stronger than adapted child. But actually they're not. Because they're still in response to that controlling parent. The controlling parent says, time, you're late. And he says, no, I'm not, not that much. But he's still in reply to the parent. If you can come back from adult, how much better that would be. You might not choose to come back from adult. You might choose to come back from, you know, adapted child or, or rebellious child. But if you know how to go in adult, then you've got choices, haven't you? You've got choices. You're not stuck there in child. Complementary transactions. Remember we talked about that. Parent, child, parent, child, parent, child, adult, 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 adult. We might have parent, 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 or child, 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 child. But they're called complementary transactions. Why? Because they complement each other. Yeah. But then we can have a cross transaction, which is that one where we say, what's the time? And she comes back or he comes back with, you're late again. And that's crossed. And that feels a little bit of a jolt. What do they mean by that? I, I, you know, and that's the sort of feeling you get when you have those sorts of conversations. Oh, that's all right, love. What do you want to say? How many fish fingers do you want? Five. Five. <laughs> I'll give it five. I'll give it five. Five fish fingers. We're just going to have lunch now. Yeah. So usually if somebody's invited you to go into a cross translate tra transaction, crossed, invited you, you're late again, you're usually going to go into it. You usually are. Yes, well, you are. That's what happens. I'll probably go into adapted child and apologize yeah or I might be in rebellious from the same ego state we've said that oh, I couldn't help it don't know what you're making so much fuss about and so that original adult what's the time it's been forgotten yeah so when a transaction is crossed a break in communication results that's what usually happens. I call it like a little jolt. You feel it. What's gone on there? Just a little mild jolt. If you notice that if, when you're in conversation with others now. Do you feel a little bit like that? If you do, they've, they've crossed the transaction. Now, this week... We're going to go and talk on about this. I'm just introducing it to you. We're going on to go on to about ulterior transactions. Two messages are conveyed at the same time. And do you know what? 
we always read the ulterior. We always do. In fact, when I first started counselling and first started making changes for myself, Pete used to always, we always read the ulterior and I used to have to say to him, no, no ulterior here. I'm asking you a genuine question or I'm saying something genuine. Yeah, because his his default system always came back with this red ulterior. So sometimes we can read ulteriors when they're not even there because we've been so used to it. It's a psychological level message. So social level, content, adult, adult. Social level, adult, adult. What's the time? One o'clock. Adult, adult, social level. But the psychological level are usually parent, child or child, parent. You can get that, can't you? You can see that. Yeah. So we've got an illustration in the book. I'll make one up of my own in a minute. Husband, what did you do with my shirt? Notice he's coming in parent. What did you do with my shirt? Wife, I put it in your drawer. Adapted child. Now, if we just looked at that written words, we'd say adult to adult. What did you do with my shirt? I put it in your drawer. So with TA, we have to hear what's going on. We have to visualise what's going on. And that's why so many people get in trouble with texting now. Because I might text to you, oh, what did you do with my shirt? I'm reading it adult, but actually what behind it is, what did you do with my shirt? So that's why when we text, all these emojis have come about because we might we might have to put a smiley face on or, or a laughing face because otherwise it doesn't sound like we're laughing. So we're putting the sound and visuals on, aren't we, with the emojis. Can you see that? What did you do with my shirt? I put it in your drawer. But the psychological level is, you're always messing with my things. Why don't you just leave them on the bed? Why didn't you just leave it where I know where it is? Oh, says the wife. I'm being criticised again. Yeah, that's the psychological message. So we need to be able to, to hear, we need to be able to see, to really get the true meaning of that message. Because with just words, we can't do it. So, no one transaction is good or bad in itself. If you want to maintain that smooth flow, then keep your transactions parallel. But if you find it's often jerky or you don't quite know what's going on, think about it. They're coming from a different angle from where you, you know, so you can decide. Oh, we've got flicking light now. You can decide where to smooth it out. So a salesperson might say, oh, sir, that camera is top of the range. It's a bit beyond your budget. Controlling parents. And what he's trying to do is put you in child. Say that to Pete. Oh, I'll take it. Yeah, you know? So, parent, child, he's wanting to put you into child. Oh, that's a bit beyond your budget. But, you know, if you think about it, maybe you might be able to afford it. Oh, <sighs> you see? Well, if I'm going to stay in parallel, you know, the same, parent, child, parent, child, I'll either come back with, yeah, um, oh, maybe you're right, but I, I, I might be able to just manage it, adapted child, because I've got the feeling he wants me to buy it. That's why he's saying it. Rebellious child, oh, I'll take that. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Well, I, I could choose to cross it. I could say an adult, you're quite right. I think I'll look at a different model. That's, a, that's not good for me. Depends how you are when you're confronted with that, as, you know, that salesperson talking to you. I'm thinking of myself. If somebody said, that's way beyond your budget, 
well, I think as a adapted child, I'd be scared. I'd say, oh, righto, and I'd leave. So he'd, he wouldn't get the sale. But with Pete, he'd say, oh, no, that's fine. I can do that. And he'd get the sale. But also, if you come back from adult you, and you're not, you're going to come back from a different ego state to what he wanted to push you into, or she wanted to push you into. If you're coming back from adult, um, no, you're thinking, no, no, I can manage that. That's, that's, that's in my budget. Or no, you're quite right. I think I'll give that a miss. I'll look at the next, next model down. In adult, we're thinking in the here and now, making decisions for ourselves. We're not coming back. As, a, as an impulse reply. And that impulse reply would come from child. It could come from parent, couldn't it? Thinking about it, you know, that's way beyond your budget. So uh, I might come back from parent and say, don't start telling me what my budget is. Yeah, can you see? So we're going to open all this up and we're going to do a bit more as we go on. Next week we're going to be talking about strokes and then gradually I'll still incorporate that but we'll go on to talk about strokes and we're then going to get the bigger picture. But have a think about if you have a little jolt or where someone might say something to you and you come back in child. Of course free child's great to come back into. So your boss might say to you, oh you know I wanted you to photocopy that and get this report done. Um, I sent you around an, a memo. Oh, um, I try and check all my memos, but I, oh, I'm really so sorry. I must have missed that one. Oh, well, never mind. You know, do better next time. If you can manage to check, see, we're, we're parent child, parent child. But you can choose to come back in adult or in free child. You could come back in free child. You could lay on the floor and say, lunch is ready. <laughs> Lunch? Yep, yeah, I'm coming. Coming. Yeah. Yeah, so you could come back and say, um, I'm rubbish at this job. When do you want to fire me? You know, and, and make a joke of it. Come back and free child. Or you come, could come back in adult. Now, what would you like me to do? I'm obviously missing these memos, so how can we devise something better? Would, would you be able to give it to me personally? Or, uh, yeah. See the tone of voice. We need the tone, what we're going to say. But what we're starting to do is open it up to see that we've got choices where we come back from. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to say cheerio for now. We've got the little film now. If you see the squirrels, you'll know I, I will have done some filming. If not, you know, I haven't caught them that they've gone to tuck themselves up. And I'll see you next week. So thank you so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, we'll see what next week brings. Bye, I'm back. Just before I go, I just wanted to say, as this this um, uh, chinwag is all about family, really, there's three family members I just wanted to mention. One is Pete's mum's, Pete's mum, her brother. And they all got, all oh, they were all excited, the end of the First World War. And uh, they all worked to welcome him home. Unfortunately, he died on the 6th of November, 1918. So I'll put the photo up here of him. There's a, a photo of, uh, we don't know who it is, his chums, I think. But he's the tall one in the middle. Because Pete comes from a tall family. His mum wasn't tall, but his granddad was a grenadier guard, you know, with the with the big hat outside Buckingham Palace and all of that, yeah. Um, then I'm going to say my nan's brother, Daniel Ernest Burdett. He died on the 16th of November, 1916. And what's very touching, I think, is when I look at most people's, you know, their effects, um, you see they leave it to their wife or their mom or their sister. I said, no, no, not Daniel. He, rec he puts down everybody. That's how I know it is Daniel because of the family members that are mentioned there. It's a great long list. So I think he's got about £10 or something and it's all, you know, divided up. It's a long list of who he wanted it to go to. Shows you how close he must have felt to his family. 
And then there's my granddad's brother, my mum's dad's brother. I think we've spoken about him. Uh, mum knew nothing about him because he died on the 13th of November 1916. So there's three men that made a big difference to our families. So I just wanted to put them up here and uh, now I go on to the little film. I got a little bit for the, for the squirrel, so it's in there. So I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.